Dr. Caplet, you can start. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, this is the uh, webinar for the This Is Your Brain podcast with Dr. Philip Stieg. Dr. Stieg is the chairman of neurological surgery at Weill Cornell Medical College. Um, and I am a uh, guest hosting myself today. Um, I am Michael Caplet. I am the vice chairman of the department for research, uh, director of the residency training program and uh, my subspecialty, I direct the um, uh, movement disorder surgery program uh, in our department at Weill Cornell, uh, as well as my own uh, research laboratory. So it's a pleasure to talk to everyone today about the subject of brain surgery without a cut, how focused ultrasound is revolutionizing the treatment for tremor, Parkinson's disease, and more. Um, uh, before we begin, there we go, okay. Um, before we begin, um, I just wanna say that if anybody has any questions, we will uh, have time at the end for questions. Please put them into the chat box below for those of you who are less familiar with this system, there is a little uh, icon uh, somewhere on your screen that says chat uh, next to the uh, video and participants and other things. And so if you just type the message in, uh, I will be reading the questions at the end. Uh, and if it's something that I've not covered, I'll be happy to answer it. Just again, for those less familiar with this format, uh, when it says to everyone, uh, that means that everyone uh, who's allowed to see it can see the question. So just so you're aware. Um, but I really appreciate all the participants here today. Now, um, many neuropsychiatric disorders are really a, 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 a due to a problem or a dysfunction of circuitry in the brain. The brain is composed of a variety of circuits that serve a whole lot of different functions. Um, pretty much everything that makes us human is due to particular circuits in the brain. And while many devastating diseases that we are aware of, such as essential tremor, Parkinson's disease, memory disorders like Alzheimer's disease, even things like epilepsy, et cetera, are due to problems with these specific circuits, as neurosurgeons, they present us with opportunities to intervene very specifically because in most of these cases, it is not the whole brain that is problematic, it is particular circuits. And we are very well trained and specialized in trying to safely access these particular circuits in the brain to improve their function. Now, the traditional way that we have tried to do this for diseases such as tremor disorders, essential tremor and Parkinson's disease, is with a technique called deep brain stimulation where we put an electrode into the brain through a small hole that's made in the skull. And we put that wire into the middle of a circuit that's responsible for one of these disorders. And then as you can see in this picture, that gets attached to an extension wire that runs down to a battery in the chest that's very much like a pacemaker, a cardiac pacemaker that controls all of this. That's why most of the devices are made by companies that also make cardiac pacemaker devices because the technology is similar. Everything is implanted inside of the body is a very successful technique um, and it is something that we still do here every single week because there are many indications that are appropriate for this procedure, but that is not the subject of what we're talking about today. So I don't have time to get into the details of, of what, when patients are right for this procedure. The diseases that I'm really gonna focus on initially are essential tremor and a little bit of Parkinson's disease, and then we'll broaden it out at the end. Um, both of these are disorders of movement. Um, and so they affect your ability to move or function appropriately. Essential tremor, as the name implies, is a tremor disorder. It is an isolated tremor where when you go to move, you have a severe tremor. Otherwise, often people uh, do not notice a problem. It would be hard for outsiders to tell that you have a problem unless it's in a very, very severe state. But when you go to lift a glass, use a spoon to eat soup, use a mouse on a computer, write with a pen, those things become problematic, increasingly difficult, and in many cases impossible as the disease advances. That is a disease that is often but not always inherited. So families can have this. And I have personally treated um, several instances of parents and children over the course of my many years in practice um, who have had the disease. I've had people that I've treated with deep brain stimulation 15 or 20 years ago who I've now treated their children with the ultrasound procedure that we're gonna talk about today 
which shows you how much progress we've made over the years. Um, and then there's Parkinson's disease, which is a more complex movement disorder that involves not only tremor, although it's a different type of tremor, it's what we call a resting tremor, which is a tremor that happens when you're not even moving, as opposed to essential tremor, where the tremor mostly happens when you move. But Parkinson's disease also has uh, stiffness of the muscles, slowness of movement, so-called freezing, difficulty with problems with walking. As the disease advances, people can have problems with speaking, they can have problems um, with balance, eventually memory. Those are all things that don't really happen with essential tremor so much, um, but can be very devastating to people. And in both cases, there are medicines that people try that my neurology colleagues will use initially. But over time, when these symptoms become very problematic, first the tremor, which is what we'll talk about next, but eventually there are applications we're using for other symptoms of Parkinson's disease in particular, when these become problematic and the medications are either no longer working or they are causing side effects, intolerable side effects, because these medicines go all over the body and all over the brain. The medicines are not targeted to the specific circuit that is responsible for this problem or this tremor. They go everywhere. And many of the side effects of these medicines are either because of effects they're having on other organs in your body, blood pressure, adrenal glands, whatever, or side effects on areas of the brain that are functioning perfectly normal, normally and don't need any medication. And yet they are seeing these medications and they get side effects. So that's the problem that often happens with medication over time as people develop these side effects, they develop resistance to medicines, et cetera, where they simply just don't work well enough from the beginning. That's when surgery can be more helpful. Now, Deep brain stimulation has a lot of advantages, but it is an invasive procedure and you do have to put a device in the body. So could we do things without any incisions, without invading the brain, without putting anything in the body? So this is not invasive brain surgery in 1968. This is an actual screenshot from an episode of the television show, Star Trek, that uh, some of us are old enough to remember. Uh, and this was an episode where the doctor, Dr. McCoy, was using one of his many non-invasive ways to try to fix a brain problem, in this case, trying to transfer Spock's brain into someone else, into himself or someone else. I was really struck when I saw this picture because this was 1968, this was entirely science fiction. This is non-invasive brain surgery today. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, you will see a helmet that is not too dissimilar from the helmet you just saw in 1968, except this is real. This is what we are using today to do the same type of thing imagined almost 50 years ago, that you could actually repair people and improve their problems, including complex brain problems without invasive surgery, which seemed far-fetched at the time. So the idea of ultrasound is that ultrasound will go through the skull and uh, will go through the brain. But each beam of ultrasound as it goes through the skull and through the brain is very low energy. And it is somewhat similar to the ultrasound that many people are aware of that's used to check uh, arteries, carotid arteries for plaques that is used to look at babies when um, people are pregnant. It's a similar type of ultrasound. And so these are similarly low energy beams that will not cause any injury to the brain as they pass through the skull and the brain. But this helmet that you can see in the upper right hand corner is studded with 1000 sources of ultrasound throughout the helmet, all of which are focused on the same spot. That is why this is called MR guided focused ultrasound. We are focusing a thousand beams of ultrasound all coming from every direction in the brain towards the one spot that we wanna hit. And then the energy of this 1000 beams of ultrasound is added up at the spot that you wanna target so you can deliver a high amount of energy to that target only by adding up the energy of a thousand beams of ultrasound without affecting the rest of the brain. So you can create enough energy at that precise target to actually heat that area up and eventually ablate or destroy these areas. And in essential tremor and in Parkinson's disease, one of the problems is that these circuits become dysfunctional. They don't function normally anymore because of the disease process. And there are regions within these circuits that are sending abnormal information to the rest of the brain every, every time you try to go to move. 
So by ablating or destroying these precise spots, leaving the rest of the brain alone, we can free up the remainder of the movement circuits to function better and usually stop the tremor immediately on the table right before your eyes. It is very similar to when many of us were children, uh, we would use a magnifying glass on a sunny day, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner and burn a hole in a leaf or a piece of paper by using that magnifying glass to focus or concentrate beams of sunlight onto one spot without affecting the rest of the leaf or the piece of paper. It is a very similar concept. That is the idea of focused ultrasound to ablate dysfunctional targets in the brain, non-invasively, without surgery, without opening up the skin, without any implant to try to relieve um, uh, the abnormal circuits and improve symptoms. This is how it works. You see that the patient's head is fixed or held in this device that we call a frame so that the head can't move. It's done in the MRI machine. And then you can see in this cartoon that these beams of ultrasound are all targeted at this one spot as we just talked about to deliver high energy. One of the other, the reason it is called MR guided focused ultrasound is one of the other major technological advances that is remarkable is that the MRI machine that many of you have had MRI images in the past is capable of measuring temperature in the brain. It's called MR thermometry. That technology has been available for a while. So we can get a picture of exactly what area of the brain is being heated to what temperature. So what you can see here is a curve that shows us when we've reached a maximal temperature. And then the picture on the right shows us an area in red of what portion of the brain has been heated to whatever temperature we're choosing. So we can uh, move the scale so that we can see more or less of the brain area that's heated depending on what temperature we choose. So if I ask the machine to show me what area of the brain was heated to 45 degrees centigrade, let's say, human body is at 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit. If I ask the machine to show me what area was heated to 45 degrees Celsius, it will show me a fairly large area. Then I ask it to show me what area was heated to 50 degrees Celsius, and it will show me a much smaller area. And that way I can get an idea of what area is being heated relative to the target. So for example, here you see that the heating, that if the target is the dot in the middle of that circle, the heating is going a little bit in front of the ideal dot. You'd want that dot to be in the middle of that red spot, not at the edge. So we can move this and we can adjust it and reheat it so that that now goes into the center of the red spot. <clears throat> the ablation, the ablation occurs at roughly 55 to 60 degrees Celsius for about 10 to 20 seconds. So anything below 50 degrees is unlikely to cause any permanent change. So what we do to keep this procedure safe is we start out with uh, heating at a lower level of energy so that we heat to somewhere around 46 to 49 degrees so that we can see the area being heated and make adjustments to try to make it more perfect before we raise the temperature to a level that will do anything permanent. That is important because the targets that we choose for these procedures sit in areas that are extremely close to important things that we don't want to affect. There are circuits right next to it that affect your ability to speak. So if you injure them, there could be some slurring of your speech. There are areas right behind that affect uh, your sensation, that control sensation. If we affect those, you could get numbness in some part of your body. So we want to avoid those things. And so we do that first by making these adjustments before we've heated things to a point of there being any type of permanent effect. And secondly, you are awake during these procedures, so we can test your sensation, we can test your speaking, you're talking to me, et cetera. And we can test, of course, your tremor to see when it gets better. And that's the key. By combining that awake exam with all of these other um, advances, we can make this very precise and in most cases, extremely safe. And at the end, what you see here, where that red arrow is, is the ablation. You see that there's a little um, white spot that is in the area that we targeted that looks very different than the equivalent spot on the other side where you do not see that white spot. That was the side that we targeted. <clears throat> and so you can see that the rest of the brain was left totally alone. <clears throat> 
And just that spot responsible for tremor is taken out. Now, another thing that we helped to pioneer at our institution with our radiology colleagues who are, who are our partners in this and who we work very closely with was to actually use advanced imaging to identify these various circuits that I'm talking about. So if you look, in green is the circuit we are trying to remove or trying to eliminate. That is the circuit responsible for tremor, but it also is responsible normally for coordination and stability. So when you remove it, sometimes people can be a little bit unsteady in their walking or be a little discoordinated until their brain gets used to it. But in almost every case, we have seen this improve over time when patients do have a sensitivity to this. But in red, just next to it, you can see the circuits that control um, speaking and movement, which we don't want to affect. And behind it in yellow, you can see the circuits that control sensation, which we don't want to affect. So this is not just theoretical. We can map out these circuits so we can see exactly what we're affecting. And so now you can see in B that the green circuit is gone because of that little white um, uh, spot or, or, or dot there um, uh, that's taken out the green circuit. And what you see, and again, we've, we've published this, is beforehand, you can see green, yellow, and red on both sides of the brain. And this is the patient trying to draw a spiral. And then as soon as we take it out on the, in this case, the left, uh, uh, the, the left side of the brain, you can see that the tremor gets, this is about a 95% improvement. And the patients can now drink upside down in the MRI machine, which they always swear to me, they're going to spill it. They can't do it. I force them to do it. And they're always amazed that they can drink now upside down. They can draw these spirals upside down. And that is coincident with that spot being created and eliminating that green circuit. Now, this is what I mean about uh, uh, doing the progressive temperature change. This is an example in the upper left of, the pa of a patient before um, we started trying to draw these spirals. And then um, a second spiral in the, in, in the second panel that's maybe slightly not much better. But then when we get in the right spot to about 50 degrees or so, just on the edge of it being ideal, you can see a dramatic improvement that continues to improve as we get to the final temperature. Now, one of the interesting things is how do we know we're done? If somebody has 100% tremor control and we see a nice spot in the brain, how, are we finished? Well, it is possible that when you, when you um, make these spots, if you look at the white arrow in panel B, you can see that there are different shades of spots there, different shades of circles. The really bright shade that's kind of in the middle and then the dark spot in the middle of that is where we believe the actual lesion or ablation is. The, the slightly darker haze around that maybe swelling because anytime you injure the body and an ablation of course is injuring the local tissue, there is swelling. Um, so if you bang your hand or hurt yourself, of course, you know, you, everybody knows you wake up the next day and your hand is swollen. That happens to the brain as well. And that swelling can cause dysfunction or block the, the uh, uh, effectiveness of these areas of the brain. So you could artificially see an improvement because of swelling. And as that swelling goes away, the patient's tremor comes back a bit. So that's always a challenge for us, knowing when we've done enough and when we need to do more. Because if we do more and the patient is doing perfectly, and now suddenly they start to have some side effect, obviously we would feel terrible about that. That's not good for the patient. But if we don't do enough, then we'd have to go back and retreat people repeatedly. Um, fortunately, that is very rare. We've had about a 10% recurrence rate in our hands, which means that 90% of our patients have had good long-term benefit. So you can see here that in this patient, um, his, that was him trying to draw a spiral in the lower left-hand corner. He's just stabbing at the paper. His tremor was so bad. And when we did the ablation the first time, his tremor got dramatically better. But about a month later, and, 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 and about a month later, his tremor started coming back. And you can see a return in the lower right-hand corner of that green circuit. And you can see again, this is now about a month later, that same tremor that you saw was gone. Now this is how he was drawing a spiral again. So he clearly had a recurrence. So we redid the procedure again, targeting the area that seemed to come back. And that wasn't because the brain regrew because that would have won us a Nobel prize. It was because that circuit was never really fully ablated. It came back to, to become more functional when the swelling receded. So we took him back to treat him again. And you can see again in the bottom right, how much excellent tremor control we got 
this was four months after um, his um, uh, treatment and he continued to do well for years. And so this was actually the first time in the world to my knowledge that anybody had retreated for a tremor recurrence. And now there've been many examples of this. So it is a possibility, but it is something we don't like to do often. We would like this to be a one and done procedure. And most of the time that's true. So people often ask, you know, is this appropriate for everybody? And for most patients, it can be, but there are some limitations. First of all, if your skull is too soft, if you have a very low density of your skull, that can be a problem because the ultrasound will not get through efficiently. It will be kind of absorbed by the skull. It can be very difficult for us to get enough energy in, but it is possible, but it is something that we are very hesitant to do when your skull density is very low. So we always get a CAT scan in patients when we're considering the procedure. And then uh, it takes a couple of days to analyze. Um, and that affects about 10% of people in the US and Europe. In other parts of the world, because of differences um, among different ethnic groups, it can be as high as 20 or 30% of patients affected. But for most um, people in the US and, and Europe, it tends to be about 10%. This has to be done in the MRI machine. It takes about two hours in the MRI machine. You're not in there the whole time. We slide you out to test you periodically, but you can't get up. So if there's an extreme claustrophobia problem, that can limit things. But I have had patients, including uh, one of the children of a, a deep brain stimulator patient who I had treated 15 years earlier was horribly claustrophobic, um, but really wanted this procedure. We got them through. We just took longer and we took them out of the machine more times than usual. We prepared extra time and he did extremely well. So none of this is an absolute, but these are things we look out for. If you cannot get an MRI because you have an implant that prevents it, this has to be done in the MRI machine. Certain things, there are pacemakers, for example, that can be changed surgically to more MRI compatible devices. If you're motivated, that can be considered, um, but th that is an issue. And then some of these other things, we have to shave the whole head, which I know is for a lot of people can be a bit annoying, but the hair grows back, I promise you. And um, most people, this is not limiting, but that is something you have to know about. Um, and then of course, if there's something else that prevents us from safely doing this. So now I'll talk, I see a couple of questions, which I will uh, answer at the end about this because um, they're good questions. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about some other applications of focused ultrasound. And then I'll, I'll take the questions because they are about some things that I haven't addressed, which is terrific. There are some other things that we're doing. So um, we have done a couple of studies. So first of all, people ask, can we only do the one side? Right now it's only approved for treatment on one side of the brain by the FDA. But we led a study that was, that was completed at the end of last year um, where we treated the other side on patients who had their first side successfully treated and whose tremor was bad enough on the other side. And the results, uh, at least to our knowledge in our practice were extremely encouraging. The manufacturer is putting all of that data together now and we will see um, what happens with that. We are waiting on submission and approval by the FDA to be able to treat the other side, but I'm very encouraged by what I've seen so far. And I'm hopeful that that will be something we can offer our patients in the future for those who feel they need both sides done. I cannot imagine ever doing both sides in a single setting because we wanna make sure that there are no side effects from the first side because then doing a second side could only make that worse. But if you do well from the first side, after a few months, uh, I could easily see this becoming something in the, in the near future that we can have at our, disposable, or at our disposal. Now for patients who don't just have tremor with Parkinson's disease, for example, have stiffness, freezing, complications of medication. There's another area of the brain called the globus pallidus, which you see in the lower left-hand corner. We can do what's called a pallidotomy. And we did that in a study um, that was recently approved by the FDA. The paper reporting that data um, has been submitted uh, um, uh, by myself and my colleagues who were doing this. So we're awaiting um, the evaluation of that paper, but it has the data was submitted to the FDA and it is FDA approved now. That is something we could use for patients who have uh, more than just tremor. Uh, that again is only approved to treat one side of the brain. Um, and that target, uh, it tends to be much better for freezing stiffness and complications of medical therapy. Um, there is a study we are actively doing now and recruiting for, for anyone who might be interested, where we are targeting a different area, which are the connections, rather than the globus pallidus, we're targeting the connections that it connects to. So we're getting the same result, but that is, as you can see in the lower right, kind of in the middle of the brain. And so it's a little bit of an easier target because things in the middle of the head are easier than out, out at the edges of the head. 
Um, and so we are now doing that on both sides of the brain in a staged fashion. We do one side, we wait six months, and then if the patients are doing well, we do the other side. That is a study that is going on right now for patients with freezing, stiffness, dystonia, which is a, a sort of a twisting, cramping disorder, dyskinesia, which is a complication of medication. And if you have tremor, we are also including you and we are seeing some evidence of tremor relief, but this is not designed pr uh, primarily for tremor, even though we think it could help. Um, that picture I showed you was from a pilot study done in um, Europe. We did the first patient in the US for this study um, and for this treatment. And, and uh, it is now a multi, a multi center international study. And we, to my knowledge, did the first patient on both sides of the brain, which you can see here. And we are continuing to do that. Uh, and so that study is ongoing for those who may be interested. And so far, it's been encouraging. Now, finally, in the last five minutes, um, I want to talk to you about another application of, of focused ultrasound. There are ways we can deliver ultrasound that don't ablate or destroy the brain, but that open up the so-called blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is, is a cellular barrier in your blood vessels that prevent things from getting from the bloodstream to your brain. It is designed to protect the brain from things like viruses and bacteria and other things that you don't want getting into the brain every time you get sick. So it has a purpose, but it does limit our ability to get many potentially um, groundbreaking therapies into the brain simply through an intravenous or a vascular injection. That is why we have to directly inject these things into the brain right now. But with ultrasound, we can temporarily open up the blood brain barrier and loosen it up using ultrasound a different way without destroying anything in the areas we wanna to target to try to non-invasively deliver more advanced therapies. Now, um, one study we're doing is to try to treat Alzheimer's disease. That study is ongoing based on some uh, preclinical work in animals that showed that in Alzheimer's animals that, that were made with Alzheimer's pathology, that that pathology, that um, amyloid could actually uh, be cleared a bit, that, that it, opening the blood brain barrier could help clear it out of the brain and improve memory in these animals. So we have been doing this with our colleagues in a few other centers, particularly at West Virginia, University of West Virginia. Uh, my colleague Ali Razai and I have been um, leading this study, trying to target areas for learning and memory to resolve uh, their amyloid deposition. You can see here that we are targeting an area called the hippocampus, which is uh, a key center for learning and memory. And on the right, you see a PET scan, which is a type of scan that allows us to look at how much amyloid there is in different areas of the brain. So the more red or yellow, um, the hotter it is. So you can see here from this paper we published that we can open up the blood. When you open the blood brain barrier, you can give an intravenous dye that's used to look for tumors and other things. We can give this dye intravenously and it will only get into the brain where the blood brain barrier is open. So you can see where these yellow, where these arrows are, that we can see this white dye getting into the brain in the hippocampus, which is this curved structure very nicely but you don't see it on the same structure on the opposite side of the brain or anywhere else in the brain because that's all we targeted. So we were very able to open up the blood brain barrier and deliver this dye to the brain. And with that, we've now been expanded. We can cover bigger areas. So you can see that we can take this PET scan in the upper left, find areas where there's a decent amount of amyloid, which you see in yellow, target that same area where you see in the upper right, how we're targeting it. And then in the bottom, is this shot of, of when we're opening up the blood brain barrier in that area with the ultrasound. So we know we can target it. And we've published that we can actually improve the amyloid uh, uh, deposition um, and reduce the amount of amyloid in these areas of the brain. And we have a longer term study that's in review right now for publication. So that study is ongoing. And that's very exciting, but we're more excited even about the idea of being able to actually deliver therapeutic um, uh, agents to the brain, particularly cutting edge agents, such as gene therapies, which is something that we pioneered here at our institution. You can see here in the upper right, that's me, a much younger me, about 20 years ago, directly injecting um, a gene therapy agent into the brain of the very first uh, patient in the world to ever receive gene therapy for Parkinson's disease, or for, in that matter, any adult neurological disorder. And that study was very promising, and we showed improvements in the patient's um, uh, movements, et cetera. This has been well published. That's what you see in the lower left graph. And we see improvements in their brain circuitry in the lower right. 
but what if we can deliver these kinds of things um, non-invasively? Wouldn't that be terrific? So right now we're directly injecting them, but we've actually in my laboratory been looking at non-invasive delivery. And what you can see here is that in experimental situations in the lab, we can open up the blood brain barrier and you see that white in the area we opened it up. And in that same area, when we look at the brain, we can deliver all these genes to these cells. So the cells that took up our gene of interest are in green and you can see how nicely. And then at the bottom, we stained it a different way. You can see you know, the large area of the brain that took up our gene of interest, which is in the dark blacker color. So this is a real possibility. And we are pursuing that very aggressively at our institution, the ability to try to do that. That is all experimental right now, but that is where we hope to be going. With that, I will take questions. I think we are at our 30 minute limit, but I, I'm told I have a few minutes for questions. And so I am going to go through some of the chat um, to answer a few of the questions. Um, so uh, one, question, one question, which is a great one is I've been diagnosed with essential tremor. Do I need to go through various steps such as medication first before I would qualify for focused ultrasound? And um, because of the fact that this is gonna be put out on the web, my answer is yes. I'll give you my personal opinion as to how that necessary that is if you wanted to talk privately afterwards. But I think that in uh, most cases, most insurance companies and Medicare require you to have been uh, tested by so-called gold standard medications, which are either uh, beta blockers such as propranolol or um, uh, sort of anti-seizure type medicines such as primidone. These are both designed to just quiet down the brain. Those medicines are not targeted specifically to circuits that control tremor. And that is why patients can have a lot of side effects from these medicines because it quiets the whole brain down. So people get tired, they have low blood pressure sometimes because they can affect uh, the heart rate and blood pressure systemically. Um, people have trouble concentrating, et cetera. And a lot of times they just don't work very well. So you usually do have to have tried it, but you don't necessarily have to have tried it for years and years, usually a couple of months or something if you've never tried them before, before we go ahead and consider this procedure. Um, so that is a good question. Um, because I've mentioned insurance, this is something people ask about all the time also. To my knowledge, um, right now, this is approved for payment by Medicare, which has been more recent. So that has been very helpful to us. And there are some private insurers that have approved this. There are other private insurers that are still working their way through, even though this was FDA approved almost six years ago. Um, but my understanding is that some of the insurers that do not cover this are still working their way through it. Um, and we have had some success with insurers that don't cover it by making appeals, et cetera. Um, so Medicare is fairly easy right now, and a few of the insurers uh, will also cover this, but that is still something you would need to ask individually um, if that is, is an issue, of course. The next question, how long-term is the improvement? That's an outstanding question. With deep brain stimulation, I can tell you that I personally have patients that have been stable for over 20 years. I cannot say that with this technique because that it has only been available for um, about six or seven years. We've been doing it for six years. There are some other centers that have been doing it for about a year longer, et cetera. I know that I personally have patients that are stable out to five to six years at this point. Um, as I said earlier, about 10% of patients we'll have a recurrence and we may or may not be able to retreat, retreat that depending on what the nature is of that recurrence. And that's an individual case by case basis. But right now, the vast majority of our patients seem to be stable out several years now. Um, and so we're very encouraged by that. So I can't promise you 20 years, but I can say that the vast majority of our patients who were between four and six years still have good tremor control. Another question. I have tremors in my two legs when I rest. Will this procedure work? Well, a resting tremor, it depends on what your diagnosis is. A resting tremor is often more like a Parkinsonian tremor than an essential tremor, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have Parkinson's disease. Obviously, I cannot diagnose people off of just a chat question on the Zoom. Um, but the answer is this works for tremor in the arms and legs. People often ask, can it work if you have a head tremor? Some people with essential tremor can have a very bad head tremor, voice tremor. Again, those of us, to, those who are old enough to remember the actress, Catherine Hepburn, she had a very severe essential tremor. That's why she had that classical voice shaking that many uh, mimics uh, uh, used when they were pretending to do her voice. <clears throat> this can work for tremors in the midline, like head tremor and voice tremor, but often you have to do both sides of the brain. 
and it is still a little less reliable than tremor for the arms and legs. But leg tremor usually does respond to this fairly well, um, as well as arm tremor. As I said earlier, right now we can only do one side, but I am very hopeful that we will be able to do both sides uh, in the near future. How long after the procedure do you wait to take the spiral test? About one minute. <laughs> so that is how fast we see the response to this procedure. Sometimes if I'm kind of trying to decide have we done enough or not, I might wait again a few more minutes to see. But literally it is fairly instantaneous. Within a minute or two, we see um, that level of a response that you saw earlier. What is the size of the focus? Are there any studies ongoing treating brain tumors directly with focused ultrasound? Excellent question. There are two different types of studies going on. The major studies that are going on are with the second application that I discussed with um, uh, blood-brain barrier disruption to help deliver advanced chemotherapies and even newer agents into areas of the brain where there may be tumor cells invading the brain, but the brain itself is normal. So as surgeons, we can resect or remove tumors that we can see on the MRI. But the problem is, is that the cells often invade the normal brain. <coughs> I, ap <coughs> I apologize. <coughs> the tumor cells often invade the normal brain. So by opening up the blood brain barrier in that area, <coughs> you can potentially deliver um, very effective chemotherapies, et cetera, <clears throat> that have not been able to get into the brain. In our laboratory, we're working with a colleague of mine at the Uni University of Alabama, Jim Marco, to deliver viral agents that are capable and that he's shown by direct injection in patients can be potentially effective for brain tumors. There was a recent publication out of Canada where they showed that they can actually get improvements in tumors by delivering um, these chemotherapy agents to areas of the brain around a tumor. Um, so that is actively ongoing. There's also been a lot of discussion about using the ablation, the heating to, to destroy tumors in areas that are more difficult for us to access surgically. Um, so that is also uh, ongoing. <clears throat> Would the results be significantly different for both sides if you waited a year instead of six months? For essential tremor, I would say unlikely. I think the results would be the same. Parkinson's disease is a more progressive disease. So that's a different story. If this eventually got approved for Parkinson's um, symptoms beyond tremor, things could be different if you waited a year compared to if you did it um, a few months later. But that again is a case by case basis. In my experience with deep brain stimulation, I have had a lot of patients over the years where we did one side surgery for their essential tremor because we thought that might be all they need to get their dominant hand, the hand that you write with and drink with under control. And then we did the other side a year, two years later when they felt like it was just getting worse and, and too much of a problem for them. And we still got very good results. So I would expect the same here. Um, one negative you mentioned is not lying flat for several hours. How do you sleep at night? Well, there are some patients with severe spinal problems where they literally cannot lie flat. The problem is that unlike an operative table where I can bend, you know, anybody who's been in an operating room, um, you can, you, you've seen that you can bend the operative table in a way that can make people more comfortable. So when I do deep brain stimulation, if someone has a spinal problem, I can adjust the uh, bending of the back and of the waist and of the knees on my operative table. You cannot do that on an, MR, on an MRI machine. They have to lie completely flat and the head is held in that place. And there are just some people who, who have such bad spinal problems. And we, we try to put padding, we try to bend the legs and we've been able to make it work for most people. We just say that there is a theoretical possibility that it could be a real problem if you can't lie flat for a few hours. But, to be honest, we've not faced that situation as, a, as an impediment that we could not overcome so far. I love this question. I am 81, am I too old for this procedure? The oldest person I've treated with this procedure is 93 years old. So the answer is you are a spring chicken in my world. Um, deep brain stimulation, I am more hesitant to treat much older patients, even though I've treated many patients in their 80s. Um, but with this procedure, because we're not opening the skull and we're not opening up the head, we have been comfortable treating patients as long as they don't have major medical problems that we would be excessively concerned about. And by the way, 
with this ultrasound procedure, because we have found it to be so safe, we have sent every single patient that we've treated home within one to two hours after the procedure home. We don't admit them to the hospital. And we have never had to readmit somebody back to the emergency room because of a complication. I'm not saying that could never happen, but so far we've been very fortunate that our patients have gone home. And that evening they can go home and have a drink, have a bowl of soup, do other things that they haven't been able to do in some cases for many decades. So, um, and this included, by the way, the 93 year old. So the answer is absolutely not too old. Would this procedure in any way be used for brain aneurysms? That is Dr. Steak's specialty. We talk about this frequently. The, 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 the technology as I've described it would not necessarily be useful for aneurysms, but there are some experimental concepts where we might be able to use this for certain types of vascular uh, uh, diseases, particularly a related disorder called arterial venous malformation. So there, are, there is interest in that certainly. Final question, would this work on stroke slash aphasia patients? This is not something that will necessarily repair a problem when the injury, when the brain has been injured. So it depends on the situation. This could potentially work if you had a tremor from a stroke or if you had severe pain from a stroke. There's a group in Europe that has been doing this in a nearby area to try to treat uh, so-called central pain. It might work for something like that, depending on where the stroke was, if you had tremor from a stroke, et cetera. Um, aphasia, it is unlikely to help because that is usually because of a destruction within circuits or damage within circuits that is not easily fixed by a, uh, a, another ablation or another destruction. But for something like central pain, it is something I was just discussing today might be of interest. I do deep brain stimulation for that. And so um, it is possible that this could be helpful for that as well, which is pain due to a stroke or brain injury or something else. So those are, those are possible. Certainly if we had the ability to deliver things like stem cells or gene therapies through the ultrasound, that might be able to help with the injury from stroke or aphasia, that is it. Um, last question, and I believe then we really do have to end, does it ever go away on its own? I think you, you're referring to the tremor. Um, it is rare. Unless the tremor is due to something that is more self-limited, it is unlikely to go away on its own. Um, there are certain situations where tremors can be caused by uh, diseases that are going on in the body, particularly in the liver or elsewhere, or maybe because of uh, something going on in the brain, like a small tumor or multiple sclerosis sometimes can cause tremors. And if those things are effectively treated, then the tremor can get better. But genetic forms of tremor or inherited forms like essential tremor that are often inherited or that are spontaneous often get worse with age. They rarely get better on their own without some form of treatment. I wanna thank everybody for these fantastic questions um, and for joining us today and for your attention. Um, the last slide, I believe, is here. Sorry. Um, if you need us, we are more than welcome. We can be found on the web everywhere. This is Dr. Stieg's number. If you want to talk to him about anything in our department, not just about these treatments, but of course, if you want to reach me, uh, please call this number anytime and we'll be happy to talk to you. My team, my nurse practitioner, Kristen Stribing and others would be happy to talk to you. And then I would be more than happy to see you by video or by, or in person if, I, if we can be of any help. Thank you for joining us today.